Freaknik was the greatest black gathering in America. It was like an entry point into the black cultural experience. You tried to bring back Freaknik. It wouldn't be what it was. The streets, the people, the debauchery. Things that I saw, insane. Trust me, your mom and daddy got that. Hip hop legend, First Amendment crusader, strip club owner, one time Miami Dade County uh, mayoral. Mayoral candidate. I just stood so you could read my Uncle Luke for mayor, which I preserved perfectly uh, since 2011. When yeah, Uncle it's Luke even ran. ironed. Look at it's, that. It's just, this is the only I. This is the only thing in my house that's iron, dude. Uh, Luke is also, of course, a documentary star, an executive producer uh, of of Freak Nick, the wildest party never told. The hit documentary now streaming on Hulu, and Uncle Luke can currently be seen right now on the Because Miami podcast because. In his future, on his resume, we may very well see congressman. Representative Luther Campbell is joining us now. Uncle Luke, the bulwark, uh, Mark Caputo, broke the news last week that you are considering running for Congress in Florida's 20th uh, district. Uh, where, where is it at? Have you filed your paperwork? Are we good to go? Is it Uncle Luke goes to Washington time? <laughs> are, are, is it happening? <laughs> hey, hey, Billy, uh, first of all, thank you for allowing me to come on the show. You know, you got to say that first. And, um, you know, <laughs> even uh, if you don't mean it, even if you do mean it, I do mean <laughs> it. I mean, I love this show. Shoot, y'all, shit, y'all keep people uh, on their toes, and especially <laughs> Joe Carollo and, and everybody else. Last time I came on here, I got a thousand phone calls from. From uh, uh, your friend down there at University of Miami, but uh, <laughs> so, uh, so stop it, stop it, it. <laughs> stop it, Billy, stop it. So leave Joe the fuck alone. Okay, okay, I okay. I'll do that. Joe alone. I need you to leave leave uh, Francis alone. Sure. I'm glad you left Keon alone. I'm well, need Joe you has to leave, leave him alone. I, I need you to leave fucking, uh, who else? I mean, who else? You Now you're on Carver. I tell you I what. I mean, I need you to leave Carver alone. I need you to leave all these people alone. I tell you what, when you're a congressman, then you can tell me. That's it. That, that'll be the deal. You can tell me <laughs> who I, who I got to leave alone. And is this happening? I mean, you're making headlines. You're making a lot of news. You've got. Uh, you've got some sitting congressmen already taking pot shots at you on uh, the website formerly known as Twitter. We'll talk about that in a moment. But what is the status right now? When do you have to file? Have you filed? Is there a campaign? Am I making a documentary about it? What are we doing? Uh, yes, you are definitely making a documentary about this. <laughs> I mean, you are definitely the producer and everything. And then we're going to go from documentary to docuseries because once we win, right. you know, if I decide to go in, then this shit going to keep on going. Just imagine Billy Corbin in the room where some lobbyist is coming there and he has the camera and this motherfucker is trying to sit up there and and and, and, and sell us a bag of bullshit with the camera on. And then, oh, my God, that would be fucking incredible. By the way, this but, is part of the reason why I voted for Uncle Luke for mayor back in 2011, where he got, by the way, 11 percent of the vote, got double digits with not a whole hell of a lot of campaigning or, or staff or anything. And what I liked about it is like people asked him, Uncle Luke, what about? Tra transparency in government. And Uncle Luke says, I'm going to do a reality show with cameras following me everywhere I go when I'm mayor. What could be more transparent than that? And I'm like, this exactly. is the kind of, this is what we need. This is what we need. And that's what you need. I'm, I mean, I mean, to answer the question, man, I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm doing my due diligence, right? Because, uh, you know, I live in, obviously I live in Broward, you know, I know I'm somewhat familiar with the politics of, of Broward County. I'm obviously more, uh, familiar with the politics in Dade County, but I'm just doing my due diligence. I mean, you know, I'm going up in the Bell Glazer poll, you talking to people over there because that's a large part of the district. You know, at the same time, you got a large part of a uh, Riviera Beach, Palm Beach County in the district. And then you have uh, Broward County, a large part of Broward County uh, is in the district, which is, which is most of it. And so I'm just doing my due diligence as to see the, seeing the needs uh, of the people you know, in the community, talking to community leaders, talking to 
different uh, stakeholders and saying, okay, uh, if I do this, you know, uh, what are the needs? You know, and if I do this, you know, are you guys in support of it? Or do you like your current Congress uh, woman? You know, what has she done? You know, and, and uh, what is the and feedback to, uh, been, Uncle Luke? Are people positive? The feedback about- is the feedback basically is, you know, we supported the, the, uh, the young lady. And uh, once she got in, she turned to a diva. Hmm. We couldn't find her. She comes and have one meeting. She sends staff and nothing basically has gotten done. Uh, You know, her campaign was self-funded. You know, your good friend Bobo uh, was her (laughs) lobbyist in the in the uh, COVID days. So she made a shitload of money in COVID uh, on behalf of uh, our good friend Bobo uh, helped out in that in that situation. Um, And uh, she took the money and ran and, you know, and paid for the seat. And so basically when you pay for the seat, you really don't have um you really don't have a genuine love for the actual community. And if you have not worked as a community servant, like right now, you can run for fucking mayor in Miami and you know where all the bodies are buried at, you know, the needs of the community and all across the this the landscape. And when you get these these corporate people who have not did the work uh, don't even have any idea as to how much funding a school needs and and uh, Medicare and Medicaid and the things that people go through on a regular basis. Like we know because we got boots on the ground. We out there every day. You know, they have a tendency of just wanting to get get the uh, position for a fashion statement. And so uh, a large part of me and doing my due diligence, I'm seeing this because I'm talking with people like myself. And people like you, you know, and we we know those type of people. I ain't talking to the bullshitters. I'm not talking to the ones who want five hundred dollars, you know, and who want to have. No, I'm I'm talking to real people on the ground. Like, yo, what the fuck has this lady done? And has any resources been brought back to the community? And those are the people that are giving it to me one hundred. And so it's like I got one foot in and one foot out, and I'm gonna make a decision uh, real soon as to if I'm gonna run or not. You know, I have a little. Uh, structure of a group of people around me that, you know, have worked in campaigns before, you know, I try to keep a close uh, circle like I, like I did with, uh, with the campaign for mayor, you know, you know, you you get too many people, too many cooks in the kitchen. And before you know it, you become a politician. I'm not no politician. I'm not trying to be a fucking politician. I'm trying to be a person, a community servant, uh, who, uh, you know, if I do run, that'd be the person that goes to Washington. That's for the people. That's the people's seat. Well, unfortunately for me, in 2020, they uh, they wrote Miramar out of the district. They are not in the 20th district anymore, unfortunately. We're in uh, Correct. 24 and 25. So I am unable to vote for you. But if I was in the district, obviously I would. Uh, so the best that I can actually do is just help out here on the show and give you a platform and say, hey. Campaign, I, well, if you choose to. I think we just discovered is his campaign slogan, uh, I ain't trying to be no fucking politician. That's the oh, right that's on the slogan. Slogan. That's the slogan, right? That's on, I'll wear, a, <laughs> I'll right wear that with, shirt. <laughs> I'll wear that shirt, Luke. Right on the show, I'll wear that shirt. <laughs> hey, the, 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 the running slogan is, if you look at all these news articles, because obviously, I ain't, I, you know, I've got so many requests. This is the only show that I've done, only podcast, ever, because after, after, you know, it came out by Mark, you know, and Stephen and I'm like, oh, fuck that. You know, so a lot of people <laughs> been asking me, you know, they want. So the running slogan has been, I'm going to fight these motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, put, make sure you put his face on the I'll, shirt. I'll put, the, I'll put that in the, I'll put that on my shirt too. I'll wear that every day of the week, I, twice, but on, I, twice I like, on Sunday. I like that. So Uncle Luke, last night, uh, Kevin Kate, very talented filmmaker, very prominent in the political comms, you know, space. Uh, you know, campaign ads and stuff like that. Uh, he has a very popular uh, Twitter feed, particularly amongst Florida politicians, at Kevin Kate, C-A-T-E. And he had a, sp- what do you call it, Twitter spaces? What is it still? Yeah, X- spaces. X spaces. Yeah. So he, he had a spaces last night with a Florida politics talk, which, which featured several Florida congressmen, including one Matt Gates from the Panhandle, who apparently had some words to say about you. Unfortunately, it's not recorded. It's just a live one. But I understand that, you know, he had some shit to say about you paying off uh, UM players. I heard he had some shit to say about you not having the guts to jump on the spaces with him to take him on. What do you have to say to Congressman Matt Gates? 
Hey, let me tell you something. Just like I said from the beginning, that's the mother, that's public enemy number one. That's the motherfucker who I'm going out there to fight. Because at the end of the day, between him and him and uh uh Marjorie, uh, uh Lady in Red, Taylor uh, Green, Lady in the Red Hat. Yeah, the, those are the two motherfuckers who who you gotta go after first. Uh, but at the end of the day, I got into the space. I, somebody told me about the space. I went in there. It was glitching. It kept fucking glitching. And I said, look, if I get in, the guy sent me a mic and he took it back. I requested. Then he didn't send me. He didn't uh, bring me up. And one guy didn't say, oh, no, let's not get into this. Let's move on. Let's talk about uh, I want to talk to Matt and all that. And then I eventually ended up jumping out. One of my good friends was still in there, Ms. Leslie. And she said, oh, yeah, they just went on to start talking more shit that you were scared to come up. One thing people know about me, I ain't scared of no motherfucking body. And especially no no guy, you know, uh, no Matt Gates who bought pussy. You know, so <laughs> day, if I'd have came up on the mic, that would have been the first thing I'd have said. Look, bro. You know what I'm saying? You talking about I paid off players, but then you bought pussy. So you might need to have a conversation with me so I can teach you not how to go and buy pussy. You feel me? Legally. So at the end of the day, uh, he should have just go ahead and gave you, Billy, the whole credit because if you read, if you looked at the documentary, it was no time that I would say that I actually paid players off. Well, also, so, I mean, are we all wrong again? That's that politics shit, as usual. But aren't we in a we're like in a post NIL world now? You are really a pioneer in that in that space. Let's be real. And I think everybody it was Republicans in the state of Florida that led the charge to change to create NIL laws here in the state of Florida, because, you know, uh, I mean, we had the NCAA drag an ass for like decades who had had the opportunity to effectuate some sort of change and reform. And they said, no, we like the old system. We're going to keep it the way it is. And so I, that's what it's, I'm saying. Like, does Matt Gates not support NIL? Like, exactly. He needs to figure out what he supports. So it, what, what happens with a lot of these guys in, in, in politics, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, but most Republicans, it's just, it's hard for them to tell the truth. It's hard for them to give props and, and give credit where credit due because he could have easily said, well, the only thing I knew about Luther Campbell, which I find it real hard to understand if you are an elected official in the state of Florida and you don't know who the fuck I am, that's that's a problem. That means you lived a sheltered life. And I guess that then goes to you buying pussy. Uh, okay, so if you listen to some of my songs, you don't know. You All you had to do is just pop on a Luke song and, and then look at your girl and then, okay, she'll be on that. But that's a whole other story in itself. But to not know, to not know, you know, that your party is the one who supported NIL with your, you know, commander in chief down there in Tallahassee, uh, Commandante, you know, he was the main one signing NIL and all these different colleges, you know, I, it just, it, it's amazing. You know, they just talk just to be talking. And a guy like Matt, you know, listen, he's the guy, he and Marjorie and the whole Trump and this whole soft ass Democratic Party team is the one that's motivating me to go and run and, and God willing, I win, they're going to have hell to deal with. What you, in, in, in Washington, Luke. What do you mean soft? Yeah, what do you mean circle? What do you mean soft ass Democratic team? What does that mean? I mean, well, the Democratic Party is old, and we're a little soft. We let these. I mean, you go from the Tea Party spitting on uh, 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 congressmen and senators and shit. You know, then you go Trumps on steroids. You know, after Trump on steroids, and they talking to to the party in all these different types of ways. Now you have. They, they came up with, they go from CRT to banning books to all these attacks against African-Americans and democratic values. You know, when I look at that and I'm saying to myself, you know, we need somebody to fight. I mean, we got Miss Crockett, you know, uh, Congresswoman Crockett, you know, she's fighting. It seems like she's out there fighting by herself. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you have all these policies against African-Americans. You don't have too much money going back into the African-American community, whether it's Ron DeSantis taking it and holding it, you know, holding it in Tallahassee and the money not being trickled down. You don't have enough. Uh, you got a bunch of old, old ass congressmen and women. I think they need to create terms where some of these people need to turn them out. They don't have no more fight in them. You know what I'm saying? 
And so at the end of the day, you know, you need fresh blood in there, not necessarily in a young person, but fresh blood of people like, you know, myself, people like you to go up in there, people who are on the ground floor that, that understands what the people need, because this shit is about the people. It ain't about, you know, uh, lining your pockets. You got some Congress women that went in as, as fucking uh, waitresses and bartenders, and now they work 28 and $30 million. I mean, that ain't, you know, and then they, all of a sudden, they, they, they came in guns are blazing, but then they, you know, they, they got a muzzle on them right now. So, you know, it just needs to be people who go in and represent uh, the actual people and bring shit back, man. I go to Boyd Anderson. I rode through there and I'm looking at the high school. You know, I love Boyd Anderson, great history. And you looking at the high school and you seeing that this shit is depleted. It's like a third world country school where you need federal dollars to be put in there. You need representatives to be able to go and say, hey, look, man, you know, we need to change this. Those kids ain't got a fucking chance. So everybody think, oh, all right, we want to stop the gun violence in the black community and people killing each other. But then when you look at the politicians, a lot of these politicians ain't doing the work to then be able to educate these kids and bring uh, good, good paying jobs. You know, and not this fucking thirteen dollars an hour shit. You know, and I, I mean, think about it. I mean, the national, the, I mean, we have a government that the 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 fucking the the uh, minimum wage in the United States of America is seven dollars, seven to eight dollars. But thank God, state of Florida is thirteen, twelve to thirteen dollars. You know, you got people in Bell Glaze. Why the fuck does Bell Glaze look the same? Why haven't nobody uh, been creative to create housing and create different opportunities for these people? So it's a lot of work to be done. You know, Uncle uh, Luke, it sounds to me like you just talked yourself into running right here that's what on I've the been show. Doing, I mean, we got April. I think the deadline is at the end of this month to file yes. to run in the Democratic primary, which I believe is in August of this year. And, and we are on our way to Representative Uncle Luke, Congressman Uncle Luke, or is it Uncle Congressman? Luke, whatever it is, I'm looking forward to it. And I have to extend an invitation to Congressman Matt Gates to join us anytime on the Because Miami podcast if he'd like an opportunity to respond. Gracias, Matt Gates. Or and, debate. At, or de- yeah, or bring or his de- soft ass on here. <laughs> or debate? Before I announce, bring his soft ass <laughs> on here. Freak for motherfuckers who don't know who I am, if you only know me for for uh, uh, allegedly playing, paying off players, then I need to give him a good education. We need to sing. We need to play some songs for him. Well, he doesn't that, know his history because he's trying to eliminate it. Me so horny. We need. We need to. Sing. <laughs> well, Matt Gation, he should already know that there's a song exists called "Me So Horny," and and because. Uh, you know, again, Matt, if, Matt, Matt Gates knows exactly who you are, <laughs> Uncle Luke. There's no, no zero <laughs> doubt in my mind. Freak Nick, the wildest party never told, co starring and executive produced by Luther Campbell, is now streaming on the Hulu machine. I just started it, it's so good. Uh, I'm loving it. And thank you, Uncle Luke, as always, for being here. And uh, I look forward to wearing the shirt. I look forward hey, to wearing man, the shirt. I love the shirt, baby. Uncle hey, Luke for Congress. This one. Luke for, uh, then it'll be Luke for Congress. So they got to get you. Oh, look at that Luke for me. You, you, boy, that boy, you looking good, Billy. You looking fucking good. It's all about the Luke. That is <laughs> Congressman Luther Campbell. Thank you so much for being here on Because Miami. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was March 1st when Joshua Epstein was arrested by Surfside Police. He's the teenage son of Eliana Saltower, a vocal critic of then Surfside Mayor Shlomo Danzinger. Surfside Police charged Epstein with battery on an elected official after he was accused of pushing then Vice Mayor Jeff Rose. Keep pushing me, John. But there was never any video of the alleged push. And now the charges against Joshua dropped. Anyone who had their hand in this will be held accountable. And I don't mean just losing their jobs. They will be held accountable. Wow, so you're going to take further action as a father. 100%. That is my only job, to protect my son. Joshua Epstein is the son of former Surfside Commissioner, uh, Ileana Salzhauer, who has been a guest on this show before. And uh, it seemed abundantly clear to everybody objectively observing the situation that this was some sort of political retaliation against her against her son uh, Joshua Epstein for speaking out against this 
bizarrely corrupt regime in this eight block long town uh, just north of Miami Beach uh, in Miami Dade County. And Joshua Epstein is joining us now, fresh from his arraignment uh, on Monday of this week, in which the Miami Dade State Attorney dropped all charges against him and, in fact, confirmed, consistent with most of the witness testimony, that in this incident at a candidate forum at the Surfside Town Hall uh, last month, ahead of the March 19th. Uh, town elections, that Jeff Rose, the then vice mayor, was the aggressor in the matter, crossed the room to confront another resident. Josh somehow got kind of caught up in this verbal melee, and the rest now is history. So, Josh, I got to ask you out of the gate. Did you push Jeff Rose? Did you put hands on him? No, of course not. I I didn't touch him. No one else touched him. He came across the room and another resident. Uh, The state attorney, if you read their call, the report says, He's in a boxing stance. He's, he has his hands up. He's going crazy. Um, I didn't touch him. No one else touched him. And it strikes me that all of the witnesses on the list uh, that the state attorney cites are either related to Jeff Rose uh, or there was a, a town employee who's obviously at the time his employment was contingent upon the support of Rose, who was a then elected official. And also that guy seems to to have an evolving story. There seems to be some inconsistencies in his statements to police and the state attorney's office. Then there's all these other witnesses, right, that come out that are saying, like, no, we were there. We saw the whole thing. This was an open and public forum in a public space, and there was nobody laid any hands on anybody. So they refer to it as conflicting witness testimony, but it seemed pretty convincing witness testimony to me. Yeah, I mean, the the witness testimony was Jeff's family and his one employee making up a bunch of BS and every other objective witness there going, no, did no one ever touch Jeff? Uh, and he was the aggressor. Jeff comes across the room. Uh, you have Jeff's employee who actually, I think two weeks before, has to be pulled off of my mom by the police chief because the, that same that town employee who gives the gives the ever evolving statement hmm. Um, that's the same, that's the town employee that lost the, the audio for the first commission meeting. So my mom was going, trying to make sure that he was recording a commission meeting and then he gets completely flustered and has to be pulled off of my mom. <laughs> so he is someone that has every vendetta against my family. He's someone who's not done his job and is part of the, the KGB atmosphere that has consumed town hall. So there's objective, uh, residents and then there's Jeff's family and this one, uh, not trustworthy, uh, an ever evolving story, uh, town employee. You're 18 years old, you're a college student, you want to get involved in your government, you want to peacefully confront your government, as is not only your right, but one of the greatest traditions of this country, uh, to to be able to uh, ask them questions, to have transparency and accountability, to enjoy satire. We have Uncle Luke on the show today, a great uh, uh, satirist and First Amendment uh, crusader. Let's talk about the politics of this. On Wednesday night when this incident occurred, Jeff Rose reports it to the police and then signs a no-pros form, meaning he's saying, hey, this happened, but I don't want to, quote, ruin this kid's life, end quote, by arresting him over this, so I'm going to sign on paper and acknowledge I'm not going to pursue these charges. Yeah, I mean, this 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 started with me actually going to the police for, for protection. So after Jeff Rose had gone crazy... He's in the video saying, uh, watch what happens. You're just like your mother. Watch what happens. And he's being held back by a town employee. I go to the police station and go, this man, like, I'm scared of him and I want a protection order. And you see that on two hours of body camera. I'm going to the police saying, find the the, find the, the recording of what happened. You'll see that he's the aggressor here and I'm scared. So this um, starts with you making a complaint then. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I went to the police for help. Um, they said, OK, we're going to go into the back and find the video. Uh, For 30 minutes, they're gone. They come back into the room and they say, we had just talked to Jeff Rose. So I filed, I dare to get protection against Jeff Rose. They say they're looking at the video. They don't look at, and they don't find any video. Instead, they go to the vice mayor's house to ask for his version of events. Then they come back and say, the vice mayor says you uh, you pushed him or you you assaulted him, but he's he's not going to, he's not going to press charges. He's going to extend an olive branch to you. So I ask for help. They then go to the vice mayor's story and try to flip the script on me. But Friday afternoon, they arrest you. So sometime between Wednesday night and Friday afternoon, something changes. And that's so where it, thir- it seems to me thir- like the, the politics come into play here. So Thursday, the video of the vice mayor going crazy, because the vice mayor tries to portray himself as this nice guy. Huh. But he, he's not. He's, he's not. So I'm he sorry. Goes- I'm sorry. One second. I want to say this 
quite clear and unequivocally. I've, I've invited this guy in the show at least two or three times. Uh, and I want to say, I believe him to be, in my opinion, a fucking bully. Okay? You're an elected official. You're a public official. Uh, what this guy thinks is harassment and, and intimidation is constitutionally protected speech. Okay? Asking questions of your government is fundamental. Okay, and if you don't have the skin for it, if you're going to be a thin-skinned, whiny little baby and a fucking bully who wants to push around 18-year-olds, okay, man up. I'm sorry. Uh, that was my, I'm going to get off my Billy I mean, there's a lot of F-bombs in this episode. I'm going to get off my, well, Uncle Luke's on the show. It's uh, as nasty as you want to be. But I just, I'm going to get off my Billy pulpit. That doesn't mean that you have to be nasty. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm too live. We, got, we went from two live crew to two live Jews right now on the Because of Miami podcast. So, Josh... I'm sorry, I, I got a little, little, little pissed there, and that's the thing. Because here's the thing, Roy. I go, I go to city commission meetings. I go to peacefully confront my government and speak truth to power and exercise my First Amendment right. Because if you don't exercise the muscles, they atrophy. Okay, same thing with rights. And this could be me. I look at at Josh in handcuffs on a Friday night. They did this, Roy, on a Friday afternoon. They called the press and said, you want to come see our perp walk? Watch our arrest. They tipped off the press, and then they waited for Josh, who was signed up to swim at the community pool. And they knew that, that he was going to be leaving his parents' house, walking to the pool, and then they handcuff him. Why on a Friday afternoon, Roy? You know why. (laughs) Because nobody's paying attention. Well, you could beat... You can beat the rap, but you can't beat oh, yeah, the you ride. Stay, yeah, you got to stay in jail for the whole weekend. You right? might have to stay in jail the whole weekend. Josh was, was he got bond, he went to bond court on Saturday morning in front of Judge Mindy Glazer, but it's still he was still in TGK for like 27 hours. 27 they were, hours. Yeah, they were hoping it would be the whole weekend. I want to talk about that. You're 18 years old. You have a criminal record. Do you have any experience getting arrested or going to jail? What was this experience like for you and your parents? Yeah. So before this, I mean, I had never been to jail, never thought I would go to jail. Um, it, It's been a traumatizing experience. I, for the past month, have maybe gotten three hours of sleep a night. Um, and my stomach's like turning at, at all hours of the day. Haven't really ate much, lost weight. Um, It's been absolutely traumatizing. I mean, not just for me, but for, for my family, for my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents. I mean, I have grandparents that are, that are uh, old Holocaust survivors, like just trying to hold on for the last few years of their life and that are now like stomach churning, upset, like what is what is happening uh, to, to my grandchild. So, I, I mean, it was it was the most stressful month of my life. Uh, it's something I never thought would happen to me. It's something that I'll I'll never be the same because of. Now, that being said, I'm wondering if you don't feel like you like a bit of a martyr or a hero. You took one for the team because I want to show you this chart since March 19th, Election Day in Surfside. There have been, by my count, at least 11 officials from the town that have either been voted out, resigned, or retired. And then, Starting with uh, oh. Shlomo Danzinger, the mayor, who was voted out on March 19th. <laughs> then you have uh, Vice Mayor Jeff Rose, the bully. <laughs> he was voted out. Also, Fred Landsman, their third vote, the majority <laughs> of the corrupt commission. Then you have Police Chief Antonio Marciante. <laughs> he retired. Then you have City Attorney Lillian Arango uh, and Anthony Recio. Uh, they resigned. Uh, then you have Town Manager Hector Gomez. He put in his resignation. Uh, and you're going to love this one. Police Captain Jay Metellus. Uh, now, what Jay Metellus did, Roy, is he self-demoted. What? I swear to you. He demoted himself. He sent a letter to the town after the election I guess knowing that he was going to be caught up in this scandal and maybe found to be a part of this kind of conspiracy to uh, arrest Josh for political retaliation, he made himself a sergeant. He was a captain, and now he's a sergeant. And the reason is he's protected by the police union now and the collective bargaining agreement. As brass, he's not protected. So he's like, oh, shit, I better try to insulate myself so it is harder for the town to fire me which is probably where all this is headed because he is all, he is like neck deep in this mess. But also, I found out just this week, uh, Judith Frankel, the the town planner, she resigned. Uh, Métis uh, Gamiotea, she retired. Um, James McGinnis, a building official, uh, he resigned. Uh, So all these people, I mean, so Josh, what I'm getting at here is really, I think, 
you helped effectuate this change. I think the town, the voters, your friends and neighbors, your family, they got fed up. And as a result of this outrageous, uh, uh, unconstitutional, uh, you know, uh, extrajudicial action against you, you transformed your entire town and maybe saved it for at least the next two years until the next election. How do you feel about that? I think it's the only bright. It's the only the only bright spot in this whole thing. So every time I see a police car and I freak out, anytime I get in the backseat of a car and I have to use coping skills that my therapist taught me, I, it's it's the little the little bright spot that had maybe had this not happened, maybe we'd still have the, the bad folks in town hall. But we still have a lot of bad folks that haven't resigned, and the hope is that the new police chief and the new town manager will clean town hall. Um, I, I I trust that they will, but it's it's gonna it's a process that's just starting because there's a lot of other uh, KGB officers, as, as I call them, in the police department that had their hands in this. The detective that uh, completely fabricated it, and, and the, the detective, the the KGB detective, he's he's still there, and that plenty of other uh, bad folks are still in town hall. Um, but what I wanted to say is before, so when they decide to arrest me on Friday, what changed between Wednesday and Friday was uh, a town email. Uh, an email went out from a resident, uh, like this underground newspaper type thing that sent the video out. And the video of the vice mayor going crazy went viral. So the vice mayor uh, on Thursday, what, what we've heard is that the town has a powwow. The vice mayor and the town manager or something, they, they get together and figure out what they're going to do. And what they decide is that they're going to go forward with the charge. They're going to un, undo the non-prosecution and they're going to try to have me, they're going to have me arrested. They're going to teach me a lesson to try to clear the vice mayor's name. Because remember, all those town officials that you saw just resign, their cling to power was the vice mayor. So they're trying to, it was the vice mayor and his folks. So they're trying to, they want to clear the vice mayor's name, make him look like he's not this crazy person that he's seen being on the video to hope that he'll get reelected. Huh. So on Thursday, after this email goes out, after he looks crazy, they decide to just put together a, a fictitious police report, a fictitious report of what, of what happened, completely made up as the state attorney's uh, as attorneys, as state attorneys uh, says, not conducting an investigation. They have a video that shows clearly it's a 5,000 person town. The police know every person in this town. If they wanted to conduct an investigation, they have 10 plus people that they can go to and ask what happened. They're literally provided on a silver platter on Friday before my arrest, the names and numbers of the people in the video. You know how many of the people they contacted? Zero, zero. They put out two statements afterwards saying they did a thorough investigation. Thorough investigation was the vice mayor, the town employee that tried to attack my mom and zero of the other witnesses. It was not a police report. It was like what they do in Russia, where they arrest you after a thorough investigation. They go, that guy, he's he's a he's a threat to our power. Have him arrested. Twenty seven hours later and a lot of trauma. Uh, I mean, that's that's what they did. And I'm, I'm still suffering the consequences of it. While a lot of town officials get to move on with their life. Uh, yeah, they resign, but they'll probably get jobs in other places. So I, I won't truly feel justice until they're, they're held accountable civilly. Uh, and also the rest of the folks that are in town hall are gone. Before we go, the town of Surfside put out a statement, final update on the February 28th candidate forum incident, town charge against Joshua Epstein dismissed by state. It reads, on April 1st, 2024, appropriately on April Fool's Day, after a thorough and independent review of the evidence, the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office announced in open court that no action would be taken against Joshua Epstein, resulting in the dismissal of the felony battery charge brought by the town against him. The Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office concluded that it was questionable whether a battery occurred, Further, it concluded that even if a battery had occurred, Mr. Epstein would have been justified pursuant to the law of self-defense in light of former Vice Mayor Jeffrey Rose's demeanor and actions at the candidate forum on February 28th. The town, through its newly elected commission and the Surfside Police Department under the direction of its newly installed interim chief of police, uh, Henry Dose, are working hard to regain the trust and confidence of Mr. Epstein, his family, and all residents for a better Surfside. Here's to a better Surfside. I'll drink to that. Then again, Roy, I'll drink to anything. Yeah, Joshua Epstein, good luck to you, to your father, uh, David, your mom, Eliana. Thanks so much for being here. Good luck to you finishing college uh, and in your future. Uh, I think you have a bright one ahead. Thank you so much, Billy. I mean, you you brought attention throughout Miami to this story. And I mean, I don't know what the state attorney would have decided had you not brought this attention. I don't think the folks in town hall would have uh, resigned or, or been voted out of office had it not been for you and the attention you brought to it. So thank you so much for everything you've done. I think I know what song is was on your ringtone right now, Josh. I think I think you know too, Roy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nobody's <laughs> listening. Roy, you know how you're always saying no, nobody's listening because nobody's listening. Yeah, that's because Miami. Yeah. They don't call it our Amy, Roy. It's my fucking Amy. I'm Amy. sorry. That was one more F-bomb. You know, I mean, one more F-bomb. What are you doing <laughs> to me over here, man? I'm so, I'm so sorry. Uh, but I will 
I will tell you, Roy, somebody's listening. And you know who's listening? He's a wife, be a wife, be a... Yeah, that's Joe Carollo. Roy's listening. Find your little Twitter account, little Billy. He's listening. And uh, I got proof of it. Uh, this is uh, on this week's uh, Because Miami, How It Started, How It's Going. So you might recall back on this very program in February uh, when the story came out that the U.S. Marshals were going to move to seize uh, Commissioner Joe Carollo's house and all of his belongings to cover the $63.5 million corruption verdict against him. And you him. went out there and laughed at him, yeah. Yes, all of that, all of that happened. But I said this on this show: You're done. How often is it that justice is done like this? That bad things happen to bad people. I'm going to go to an auction, Roy, and I'm going to buy Joe's mother's costume jewelry, and I'm going to wear it all to the next city commission meeting, like Walter Mercado. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to buy a cape too. Does anybody know where I can buy a cape? Please tell me you did like John Oliver and you just actually pulled out the jewelry and you put it on. Well, I haven't had a chance to buy the jewelry yet because they oh. haven't seized Joe's uh, property and assets yet. Hurry up with that. Yet. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, Roy. Right no, he's listening. Somebody's oh. listening because at the last city commission meeting on March 14th, Roy, this happened. Even my mother now that died is being attacked. By some of these same people laughing at her. You have one of them that was here today saying that once the courts take my house and they put up for the marshals to sell everything that I have, they're going to come in and take my mother's fantasy jewelry. Laughing at my mother like she couldn't afford That's a, to have any, chase, anything decent. Chase. But uh, and, to, to, and that they're going to buy it, to and, roast then, them and then right. they're going to put it in their necks so they could be like Walter Mercado. I mean, <laughs> this is appointment listening or viewing, you know. It's like this show gets downloaded automatically to where he, wherever he uh, listens to his podcast, I guess, right? Little Billy Corbin. Ay, Dios mio. In other Because Miami news, the city of Miami Beach is celebrating I mean, like George W. Bush on the aircraft carrier with the mission accomplished banner that they have solved spring break, Roy. I know you miss the Clevelander now more than ever. But, sure do. But uh, they're, this victory lap about saving spring break and saving Miami Beach is such bullshit. And let me tell you why. They spent all this money to run a campaign about breaking up with spring break. You remember the, the viral video? Yeah, I remember all those light-skinned people, yo. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And then they basically said, we want to kill tourism during some of the most lucrative weeks of the year for our local businesses. And without consulting with local businesses and without uh, you know, partnering with local businesses, they just killed business in Miami Beach. Mind you, we spend over $30 million a year for this bullshit slush fund organization called Greater Miami and the Beaches. One of these BS make work friends and family programs. Over $30 million a year is their annual budget. You know what their job is, Roy? To remind people that Miami has beaches. Right. It's allegedly this like tourism business promotion uh, venture. Why do we spend over $30 million a year to promote tourism in Miami Beach? when we're spending millions of dollars on an ad campaign to tell people not to come to Miami Beach. Which is it? Talk about mixed signals. You don't get to choose who gets what message, by the way. When people hear that Miami Beach doesn't want you, doesn't want your money, people just say, fuck it, I'm not going to Miami Beach. You can't just sort of say like, oh, these are all, these are just, these are dog whistles. We're just wink, winking, nod, nodding at, at very, at certain tourists, the good tourists that we like, the good, you know, the good, uh, the good immigrants that we like. We, those are the ones that are welcome Europe, here. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, from Europe, of course, yeah. But the idea that this was some sort of, uh, law and order success story when all they did was put uh, nothing but uh, militarized police and tumbleweed onto otherwise bustling, busy, cash register ringing uh, streets is just absolutely ludicrous. This is this is not 
a government interested in real solutions, in supporting businesses, in supporting the residents. Uh, this is a joke. Uh, and, and as evidenced by the headline in the Miami Herald, how a viral ad campaign and, quote, draconian, end quote, crackdown changed Miami Beach spring break. And I don't think it changed anything for the better when you ask the restaurants and the businesses on Miami Beach if they think that this was some kind uh, of an improvement. And the bottom line is it's not solutions. It's just demagoguery and fear mongering and racism. It's just backdoor Jim Crow. And guess what? You're not going to believe this, Roy. I hope you're sitting. Are you sitting down? I am. Yes. Remember when they recriminalized possession of small quantities of marijuana? They basically Mm -hmm. rescinded the ordinance that allowed police or even required police to write a civil citation, like a ticket, rather than arresting people for having small quantities of marijuana. Well, the Miami Beach Police charged at least 38 people in March with possession of small amounts of marijuana and charged at least 12 people with smoking marijuana on public property. This is according to a Miami Herald review of jail booking data and court records. Among those 50 people arrested, Roy, 38 were black. Of course. We should have, I would have taken the over probably. Yeah. On that. But all of them. Yeah. Probably would have been. Yeah. Yeah. So that said, More uh, good news and bad news from the great free state of Florida this week. The Florida Supreme Court came back on April Fool's Day, the last day that they possibly could. The deadline with uh, some big decisions on some uh, big items. The bad news is, is that in a matter of weeks, Roy, abortion will be effectively illegal. A six-week abortion ban will go into an effect. Into effect, And again, as we've talked about repeatedly on this show, uh, in the context of women's health care, um, and bodily autonomy, uh, six weeks, most people don't even know they're pregnant yet. So it is a full abortion ban with very limited options uh, or exemptions, I should say, for rape and incest. Uh, but the good news is the Florida Supreme Court did decide that on the ballot in November, Floridians will get to decide in amendments uh, three and four, first, whether or not to legalize recreational marijuana in the state of Florida, and second, Amendment 4, whether or not to vote to support uh, freedom, bodily autonomy, uh, and med- really medical freedom, which is, I thought, what Florida was all about. Where the uh, government, Medicare fraud as well. Well, yeah. that <laughs> Medicare fraud as well, but also medical freedom. Like, the government cannot intervene uh, with patients, women, their families, their clergy, their doctors, when they're having to make difficult decisions uh, about whether or not to terminate pregnancies. And sometimes they don't have a choice. It is simply in the best interests uh, and the health of the mother. We've talked about it on this show, how women have suffered from medieval torture at the hands of this government who will not allow them and their doctors to make these decisions. I I can't wait to see how this is written in the ballot. Just to confuse people, probably, right? Well, that's what the Florida Supreme Court approved was the ballot language that Attorney General Ashley Moody and uh, Governor Ron DeSantis were arguing was way too general, way too vague. Basically, what the Florida Supreme Court said was like, we may not like it, but this the uh, the voters of the state of Florida have the opportunity now to do this. And you have to remember, though, in order to amend the state constitution, you need over 60 percent of Florida voters to approve it. Remember, uh, back in 2016, Amendment 2, which was the medical marijuana legalization constitutional amendment, passed with over 71% of the vote. 71% of Floridians don't agree on anything, but they agreed on medical marijuana. It's a very different electorate here in the state now, but it's supposed to be a freedom-loving, free-market economy-loving electorate, and so hopefully they will uh, decide that Recreational marijuana is legal here. But this is my prediction. Just like uh, if you had a felony and you served time in prison, once you get out, you'll be able to vote again. I bet you the state government will write a bill saying you have to pay off a poll tax or something like that. I bet you the same thing is going to happen with these two bills. Somehow you're goddamn gonna, right, Meatball. Exactly. Somehow they're going to find a way to write a law that's going to go against us. This is the thing about that, and I think you're— 8,000% right. You know, we've had Anna Hockemeyer, uh, I'm sorry, five, four, How do you three, pronounce the name? Two, one. Roy, I think you are 8,000% right about it. We've had uh, 
Anna Hockhammer on this program, who uh, you know, from the Florida Women's Freedom Coalition, talking about this effort to get this constitutional amendment on the ballot for November, which they obviously succeeded in doing. But they're hoping that this has some sort of up ballot effect that like in other states where putting abortion on the the ballot has helped other Democratic and progressive candidates, because uh, what good does it do to pass (laughs) the abortion amendment if you're not going to have lawmakers who will respect it, who will appreciate it, who will institute policy and laws, to your point, that will allow it to go into full effect. So other states will do this, and eventually on a federal level, it will pass as well. What I'm saying is, is that Florida is immune to sanity and reason. And what's going to happen is, I think that these items have a good chance of passing, but what's going to happen is, instead of having an up ballot effect, it's they're going to split their votes. So they might vote for uh, medical freedom, you know, for women and families. They might vote for legalization of recreational marijuana, but then they'll also vote for the very same candidates and lawmakers who will find every opportunity to undermine or even usurp what will become or could become state constitutional rights. Another hopeful because Miami, Roy. (laughs) Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, bringing my hopes up. For a more progressive Florida. I really yeah. I really appreciate you doing that. I love how I went good news and bad news. I did the bad news first and then somehow managed to like actually do bad news at the end yeah. too. Vote for Luke. Sorry. <laughs> Vote for Luke. Cocaines.